This segment of our study of the Bill of Rights will take up the Seventh and Eighth Amendments. The Seventh Amendment states, In suits at common law where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved, and no fact tried by a jury shall be otherwise re-examined in any court of the United States than according to the rules of the common law. In suits at common law, what does that mean? It can be described as the idea of non-criminal law. Criminal law means the involvement of what we normally think of as crime, such as murder, robbery, etc. We do not want to get into deep here since this is basically an overview, not a law course. However, the defining characteristic of common law is that it arises as precedent in law, in that it can become autocratic by its misuse over time. In other words, what is common today may change over time into something very different from what our founders considered common law in the late 1700s. When it comes to the amount of $20 as the baseline for the right of trial by jury, the value of 20 in 1789 versus today is different after 230 years. In other words, due to inflation, $20 when the Bill of Rights was adopted is equal in value to $587 today. The Bill of Rights has not been amended to reflect this change in value due to inflation over the years. Relative to being subject to a retrial or as expressed re-examined in any court, it is according to the rules of the common law, which is basically fluid over time, but wasn't considered to be fluid at the time it was written. Much of this amendment, although not mentioned, involves property rights and suits that can arise from them. There are two ways government, for instance, can take property outright by condemning the property and taking title or by regulation that can rob the owner of the uses of the property while leaving title with the owner. The owner is rarely compensated for his loss of the use of his property. He can sue to try and get just compensation. But it's a difficult process. Property use at one time involved free use without a permit just as today when no one needs a permit to speak. The exception to property use was upon complaint by a person of how someone else used their property which violated their property rights. In other words, you were free to use your property without that use violating the property rights of another. An example might be from old western movies where the evil landowner stopped up or diverted the river and deprive someone downstream of the use of the natural stream lowering the value of the farm or ranch downstream. You have probably seen movies or television programs based on this theme. Now, with the interjection of environmental laws, all manner of property rights are violated by government and can leave the property in the hands of the owner but render its use null and void. He can claim ownership only in the manner of paying taxes, but can't use it, at least for the reasons that it was purchased in the first place. The government still gets its money in the form of taxes, but the property owner loses his ability to use the land for the reason he bought it. America's founders understood clearly that private property is the foundation of not only prosperity, but of freedom itself. Much of what is discussed in this amendment has become clouded due to, the, due to the changes in our civilization, and we urge those who want a deeper study to go to Cato.org and look at the Cato Handbook for Policymakers, number 16, Property Rights and the Constitution. Let us also make the point that if you do not pay your rent, you are evicted. Likewise, if you don't pay your taxes on property, you're also evicted. So what's the difference? For all practical purposes, the government has become the real owner of all property, not the so-called owner who in reality pays rent in the form of a tax while the property is regulated in its use by zoning, environmental laws, and other regulations imposed by the states and the federal government. Amendment 8 states, Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. Governments were known at the time for imposing cruel and unusual punishment and excessive fines. This amendment is straightforward. 
yet the term excessive bail may be in the mind of the accused and citizenry. However, the idea is that the government cannot impose a bail so high that the prisoner is incapable of paying it. Today, bail is often paid by a bail bondsman who literally gives a loan to the prisoner to be paid back with interest because the accused cannot afford it. So, I guess you can say that if it goes through a bail bondsman, the bail is probably excessive. But the entire idea is that the government cannot set bail which the accused cannot meet and therefore languish in jail until his trial comes up. I mentioned in one segment of these uh, Bill of Rights that I was involved in a trial that took three years to come to trial between the time of the act and when the trial was held. Without bail, that prisoner could be in for three years and found innocent, for instance. Three years of his life destroyed. The idea of bail is to have some guarantee that an accused person will show up for his trial or forfeit the amount of the bail. In other words, the accused will not simply flee if there is a value attached to staying and being tried. The idea remains in place, but an entirely different system has sprung up over the years than that which existed when the Bill of Rights was adopted. The same reasoning was behind the idea of not imposing excessive fines, which the guilty party could not pay and therefore would be bound over to prison. This would be a means whereby the government could incarcerate an enemy of the government into prison because they could not afford to pay the fine. The charges against people in the past, such as General Flynn and Roger Stone, are examples where the processes that exist today and their cost to the accused means bankruptcy and can lead to the accused having no defense at some point because he can't afford any more defense. As to the gr cruel and unusual punishment, this was not unusual for government to do when they were dealing with a rebel or simply a local uh, vocal critic of government. Torture was not unusual in the 18th century. They did not want a government that engaged in this practice to silence dissent. The American system set the standard for the rest of Western civilization. It paved the way for other countries to follow suit. We need to get back to the spirit of the Bill of Rights. It needs to be cherished again in the minds and hearts of our people so that they will appreciate what we have and help preserve it. The best way of doing that is to educate your friends and neighbors on the spirit of the Bill of Rights.